sleep. When I used the beamers, they were sleeping like babies. Away. Yes. Really? Wow. There is a difference. So how come Elizabeth hasn't tried your beamer? She did for six weeks. Oh really? And you liked it? It was fine. I didn't notice anything. <laughs> you didn't yeah, notice I anything. You sound like Kim. Yes. The whole thing is your cup can only take so much, and then it goes close. And you need to modulate your time on the bed. Okay, so we're going to start, guys. So um, we're running a series uh, before I go tonight, tomorrow, and Saturday. Tomorrow, the same time, 5.30 to 7. On Saturday, from 10 to noon. And it's a series on blood biomarkers, clinical biomarkers. And we're using two big vendors. Uh, Boston Heart Diagnostics. I get it. Yeah, no, no, no. There, somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. You have a hot cup of coffee. <laughs> somebody's coming. Um, so we use a Boston Heart Diagnostics for our extracellular blood tests, and we use Vibrant America for our intracellular. So, um, can you pass this around? Yes. It contains everything, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So let me um, just get everybody back to page. Pay attention now to the man at the front. <laughs> Pay attention because if we don't know, then we cannot do and then we cannot be. Okay. All of habit starts with knowing. If we do not know, we cannot do and we cannot be, right? Everything in life starts with knowing. So your biomarkers in the coming world as Dr. Lim and I have been discussing with Evian and Dr. Lee, um, we are moving into a, a data-centric future uh, where like Dr. Lim said, we will not need doctors because we'll have AI machines that would do all the analysis and they have the vast capabilities of remembering all your data like that, which a doctor today cannot do, right? And I would encourage all of you to watch a British series called Humans, where we are already living with uh, AI machines, and the AI machines are actually taking care of elderly people, and they can smile at you in the morning there and look at you and say, your body temperature today is 98.5 and we are going to go for a walk because your vitamin D levels are low. Right? Just by looking at you. <laughs> you should watch it. It's a fascinating program as how we're going to live with robots and then how we start getting jealous of robots because they're smarter than us. And the children get more intimate with the robots than with their mother. And the husband falls in love with the robot maid. Then, you know, it's fascinating. <laughs> Go read it. And everybody's jealous and they even want to kill the robot. It's amazing human beings, right? It's very interesting. Anyway, in that future, data becomes really key. And as I was saying to Dr. Lim earlier, a lot of people today have depended in the past on their doctors to have all this knowledge. In the future healthcare, the patient should be the owner of their healthcare. Yes. That is the future of healthcare. The doctor does not have enough time, the clinician does not have enough time and enough space to know all the details of every patient. It's not realistic and it's not gonna happen because as chronic illness gets really challenging culturally, there's just a lot of data to deal with. So um, in the blood biomarkers, we do two kinds of testing. Um, we look at what we call uh, extracellular, and we look at intracellular. 
So we look at what is in the bloodstream. And where does the stuff come from the bloodstream? It comes through the GI tract, right? Through food and all the things we take. And this is at the cellular level. So these are the cells. This is the bloodstream. And so we want to test what is here. That tells us what has been absorbed from the bloodstream, I mean from the food tract, and what has been excreted from the cells. So that gives us a very, very important picture of toxicity, your lipids, your metabolites, the architecture of nutrition that sustains life. So that's a very important look. This look at the cellular level actually looks at what's inside the cell, what makes a healthy cell functional, right? At the cellular level, are you functional? Uh, what's the mitochondrial strength? What's the oxygenation of the mitochondria and all the new emerging theories around that? Is that clear? So today we're going to focus on looking at your extracellular capability by looking at this test. This test, everybody has a copy now, right? Mm -hmm. So this test looks at four things. It looks at your lipids. What are lipids? Fats. Well, they're more than just fats. Kind of Kinds of cholesterols and fats that the body needs to function, right? And your test results will tell you if you have too much cholesterol or fat, whether the kind you have is dangerous, and if you're at risk of forming blockages that can lead to heart attack or stroke. So that's the first thing it measures, your lipids, right? The second thing it measures uh, is inflammation. As we know, inflammation, <laughs> chronic inflammation, is the biggest challenge of civilization, right? It is almost at the core of a chronic illness. Inflammation doesn't just affect your joints and gums, right? That kind of inflammation, what do you mean? You know, you have a swollen tooth or your joints are hurting. It can also affect your arteries. Your test results will tell us if you, what kind of inflammation you have and whether it would increase your near-term risk of heart attack or stroke. The third part is your metabolics. It tells you if you have diabetes or if you are at risk for developing diabetes. Diabetes significantly increases your risk for heart attack and stroke. So typically when we look at, and we're going to look at the numbers, um, I, I want to emphasize something, and there, sorry, let's talk about genetics and I emphasize something. Uh, genetics are very important, as I was just teaching my staff earlier. Uh, there are three kinds of things in your genes. One, the normal things that everybody has. Secondly, the things that are optimized in your genes, right? Like black people and our consumption of oxygen and our ability to run and have strength. That is a genetic capability. That's why mostly black men win the 100 meters, right? Because it's... All the marathons. Yeah, all the marathons practically because it's a genetic capability. It's not that we work hard at it, right? Or we can actually run at higher altitudes. So that's a genetic issue. Uh, but it can also cause weaknesses. So as you know, leukemia and certain cancers and certain heart problems and diabetics, most black people are prone to that. We take every ethnic group or any sex group, we can find strengths and weaknesses. That's just the way genetics are. So knowing your genetics <coughs> is a very important aspect of actually understanding your health. That is what you've been given, that's your plate of food, now what do I do with it, right? Good. Is that where 23andMe comes in? Yes, okay, so but we don't use 23andMe. We use pathway genomics because it covers a lot more genes and a lot more mutations. 23andMe is good, but you need interpretation. Yes, and we have solutions around that. It's much cheaper, 
but it is something that everybody should run. It's, it's really important you do that. Okay? Um, I just want to make sure that as we start going through this data, you understand the big weakness in laboratory data. So laboratory data suffers from some statistical weaknesses. Looking for my pen, it's here. And what is that weakness? It's a big central weakness. It's a weakness of population statistics. So we are looking across the whole population. So when we say something is green, that green, right, has come from looking at a large population of people who have tested. So that means that if we say 6.0 is the trigger for diabetes, that doesn't mean that it is the same for everybody. The problem with laboratory testing is that it takes your result and it puts it into that perspective. For you particularly, 5.0 might be the trigger for diabetes. Or it could be 7.0, what we call the tail distributions, right? And so when lab data is being communicated, many people don't understand this statistical issue. So just saying somebody is green doesn't mean you're fine because the doctor doesn't really know. It's just saying your data compared to the population says that you're fine. It doesn't mean that you are fine. So how do you know you're fine? Well, that's the challenge over time. We now begin to look at other data. So number one, we look at the trend over time. Number two, the doctor is looking at other symptoms. Number three, we are looking at other data points like glucose and other things. So it's very important that the data that we run is put in context. And that's why we run really very extensive biomarkers. Because we really want to understand the challenge of the body architecture and what's actually going on. Any questions so far? Do you get this? Because when we start talking about green, a lot of people think, oh, I'm green, I'm fine. And this is the big conversation that happens with a lot of doctors in doctor's offices. And a lot of people live with the impression that they are okay, okay. when they might not be okay. Okay? So, so I just want to make that point. So we baseline. What do we mean by baseline? We run the first time patients come into the office, in the initial consultation, we run all these biomarkers because we want to make sure that we know where we're starting and what the data is actually saying. So let's walk through it. Any questions so far? First of all, this is the best we have. <laughs> there is nothing better than that right now. <laughs> okay, there is nothing that we can run that says you have diabetes, except we look at a lot of other things that are happening, right? So it is still, there is no magic. I, I didn't go to medical school because I told my parents that medicine was an experiment. It is still an experiment. There are no answers. Everybody is just using educated guesses, right, Dr. Lim? <laughs> there are no real answers to anything. Everybody is just figuring out from a lot of data and trying to provide guidance. Okay? So let's look. Is everybody on that page? Now let's look. How many people recognize all these biomarkers on this page? So what is this page? This page. The lipids. Yeah. So let's look at the lipids. Total cholesterol. What's the meaning of total cholesterol? Of cholesterol. Yes, and look at the numbers that it's saying. So it breaks down total cholesterol into LDL and HDL. Which one is the good one, Kim? The LDL or the HDL? Shut <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think 
the HDL is a good one? Yeah, so which one should <laughs> yeah, which one should be low and which one should be high? Sorry, that, that's the better okay, way. Okay. It, it tells you actually if you look at the numbers which one should be low and which one should be high. The LDL should be high. Yes. The HDL should be low. Correct. Is that good? So does that mean HDL is not the best? Correct. All right. Are, are we making sense? I didn't hear it. Yeah, yeah. louder, guys. <laughs> uh, louder. So they said the HDL is not the best. Bad. Bad. And where does HDL come from? Come on. Simon, where does HDL come from? The bad fats. Especially the fats from fries, from fast food. The bad fats. Short chain. Right? The bad fats. It could be genetic. <laughs> it could be genetic. And and what is the evidence that you don't really do bad fats? I don't know. She just said, what if you don't do bad fats? I mean, what's the evidence that you're not doing bad fats? You eat only avocados? Well, it, it depends how your coconut oil was made. How are we sure it's good oil? You didn't make it, did you? Yeah, somebody processed it. So perhaps it may not be good coconut oil. How do you know? Well, well, that's the fact about life. That's why in the village you made it yourself. When we started depending on other people, then we ran into these problems of trust. How do we know what it is, is what we're buying? I don't know. I can't help you there. So even olive oil, they say, whatever olive oil mm -hmm. in, the, in the market, not, not of them, none of them is good. None of them? None, none of them. them. You should go and sit on a farm, place. get your olives and press it no, yourself. Well, the thing is that um, um, you, you can get the virgin oil. If you drive through the south of Spain, you'll see most of that. And you, can, you should not heat it. Because the minute you heat any olive oil, it actually breaks down. So the only oils you can heat are the high temperature oils like avocado or canola. Those are the high temperature oils you can actually... Coconut oil. Coconut oil, yes. Just like when you do go to the store, the best thing that you can do if you do buy it at the store, instead of Italy, is they have the dark green bottles or brown bottles so the sunlight doesn't break it down. Yes. Or oh, sometimes they actually cover the bottle. Yeah. So we're getting deeply specific now, right? Yes, I know. Soon, um, actually, I was uh, communicating earlier that uh, a doctor at a conference actually has navigators take patients to the grocery store to do their shopping yes. and actually create a grocery list for them and say, this is what you buy, this is what you buy. They actually do that. Sorry, we're not at that stage yet, but soon I may have to do that. I don't go to those kind of stores. I have never been inside a Vons. Yes, I don't know why you're mentioning it. I don't go to those kind of places. That's why they're dying. That's why they're dying. That's why they're dying, why they're dying. Why they're dying at a young age. They're not going to reach a handsome age like my friend here. Right, they're dying very young and he's able and walking and listening to me. So let's look at some of the other data there, right? So if you look at this report, it's a sample patient. Don't worry, it's not mine. But if you look at this report, it's a sample patient. And what you begin to see is that this person is, was born in 1969, right? I can't imagine how old they are. Somebody can calculate that for me. Oh, but, yes, 
But you can see that they are really... <laughs> oh, 50. They're 50, right? So at 50, you can see that they're not doing very well with lipids, right? And so typically, what we would do is that we are looking here at a significant diet restructuring, a nutrient and diet restructuring. And typically, what we would recommend here would be uh, a ketogenic diet to try and correct some of these numbers, and or a, a, what we call a modified Mediterranean would be what we recommend for somebody really go low and really go high on the fats, on the good fats. I have questions going back to that range, okay? Because the total cholesterol is an increase, like you said. Mm -hmm. is it increase? Yeah. So, so that is the challenge. That's the challenge with total. Yes, I know. Yeah, but total, yeah. Yellow and have more green. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the ch exactly. That's the challenge with numbers because the the sum uh, may not be, be good. But overall, the what is matters is not the sum. What matters is what the body actually uses, which is looking at which is the LDL and the HDL. So the sum is uh, indicative, but that is not what the body is interested in. The body is interested in what it actually uses. Right, so the HDLC and the LDLC are the more important numbers. And if you see that the LDL is at 93 and the HDLC is at 32, so it balances out towards a green position. Okay? Is that making sense? Okay? So let's go down. I, I'm not going to take you into some of the detailed uh, numbers that are down there. We want to look at some of the lipid ratios. Hi, Dr. Hi. Cho. How are you? Get Dr. Cho a report. You, you're good? Yes. All right. Uh, give Dr. Cho a report. Do we have a report for Dr. Cho? We don't have a handout? Okay, get one. Okay, let's look at there. Now we're looking at the particle sizes. It called the Boston Heart HDL map tests. So first of all, this map is a special set of biomarkers that only Boston measures. Right? And it is really measuring the particle size within your bloodstream. So this particle sizes is, is a very important measure. So if you look at the interpretation there, this HDL map above as you're looking at it is abnormal. The APOA1 levels are reduced in the very large alpha-1 particle and increased in the very small pre-beta particles. You know what alpha and pre-beta, right? You can see the numbers there. A pattern which is associated with abnormal HDL metabolism and an increased CVD risk. So those beta numbers should be lower than they are. And the alpha numbers are higher than what they should. Sorry, those ones are in the low range. They should be in the higher ranges. So it's important you look at the ranges and you see what is good and what is bad. So the smaller particles should be more than 20 to be green and the bigger particles should be less than 45. Oh, sorry. No, yes. The yeah, the opposite. Sorry. <laughs> should be more and should be less. Yes. Am I making sense there? Are you looking at the numbers? Okay. So this particle size, actually, if you see the videos from Boston, you see that the particle size is really the particle size of the fat molecules flowing through the, your, your arteries. And the more small particles you have, is actually better than the bigger particles because the clogs tend to form around the larger particles. So particle size, when we run the heart smart, we have a ultrasound 
that we run and it can actually show how much clogging is already on stenosis is happening in the large arteries and therefore if you're already having hardening and there are large particles then the opportunity for clogging is really it's like your drain in your kitchen right that's why you have the thing that crushes it so it can flow right and so the larger particles are going to clog than the smaller particles and for some people it's just a genetic issue that they have more large particles than small particles so if you have large particles you need to have very clean arteries so your blood can flow so it doesn't clog is that making sense yes. hello do i still have you or we're lost yes. in data okay let's look at the cholesterol balance test so the lanesterol and demosterol indicate a, a, a level of production and absorption of cholesterol so this particular person is a high producer but it's a low absorber therefore you tend to find more cholesterol in their system than normal that's what the data is saying so typically if you're a high a producer you should also be a high absorber to balance it out okay so but typically you should be a low absorber and to be sorry a low producer or a low absorber because extra cholesterol is coming from the food things that you eat and so you're not producing things that are out of proportion if you are a high producer and high absorber that's actually not good okay let's move further to the metabolics so let's look at inflammation most inflammation actually comes from the GI tract uh, inflammation is the body's response to injury or attack from pathogens so we have acute inflammation and we have chronic inflammation so acute inflammation is when we have injury and the body responds to fix that and the body then releases certain chemicals that can be identified in the blood to demonstrate that some level of inflammation is going on so if we look at the key biomarkers for inflammation fibrinogen the hscrp and the lppla activity and the mpo all of these are indicators that this particular patient is in the borderline area of significant inflammation and if that is chronic inflammation it has a lot of other issues to do with his risk for plaque instability and reduced endothelial function so therefore the plaque that's gathering in the arteries is not stable plaque right it's plaque that may break loose and that is what would then call cause strokes and other things so if your plaque is very firm as we find out when we do your uh, ultrasound or what we call the heart smart we can tell the density of the kind of plaque if your plaque is very hard that's good plaque if your plaque is soft it means that it has the risk of breaking off and forming a clot that would then lead to a cardiac event I well isn't that the objective we all would like to have <laughs> when we have no plaque um, that's really optimal and mostly you would find that in very rare people perhaps um, Olympic runners people who run marathons that's where you might find almost Oh, babies, yes, yes. Typically, yes. People who are really optimized health, what we call vitality, right? People with BMI of like 16, 17, that like the Olympic runner, uh, the, the guys from uh, Somalia who win the marathons, their BMI is about 16, 17. Not from not eating, yeah. <laughs> but they have optimized metabolism. You understand? You know the people who are thin, who have 
that level that BMI but they are actually sick these are people who have achieved that level from optimized metabolism okay all right so let's look down at the metabolic tests so uh, two of the big ones that we look at is the HbA1c and the glucose test which we try to try to do frequently as a test um, we also tend to recommend for uh, diabetic patients that they have a glucometer a tracker that tracks their glucose levels uh, for example you know that if your glucose levels is persistently high it really leads to a lot of damage and injury uh, the tr interesting thing about glucose is that it has to be in a particular range not too low not too high mm -hmm. and that's the difficulty and challenge of managing glucose overall for everyone and so the numbers there you'd see uh, are very challenging numbers to achieve the challenge I have with a lot of people or a lot of tests that are run in general practices is the HbA1c test so for example the HbA1c test that's the test for diabetes A1C. yes Yes, A1C. You see a lot of adverts on that. That's the average of your sugar over the last three months. Yeah, fasting. Yeah. The challenge with that test is that by the time your number is 5.6, you've lost almost 40% of your pancreatic architecture for your better cells that release insulin. So even though it's still showing green here, there's significant damage already for the beta cells in your pancreas and so the challenge is in the kind of therapy we do is if a patient is at 5.6 at 50 by the time they are 65 if they continue they'll be diabetic and that's why we know that if you look at the diagrams the drawings or the projections more than a hundred million Americans will be diabetic by 2025 and that's why they are building a lot of hospitals for dialysis <laughs> yeah. right because most Americans will be on dialysis because they would have had kidney failure by then which really comes from a lot of high blood pressure right so this number if you went to your doctor they would say 5.6 was good when you come to our clinic that is not a good number if you're in your 50s that's a very bad number you should be around 5.1 because if you're at 5.6 you already have that much injury and so the challenge we have culturally in medical practice today in America is that we are using these benchmark lab numbers and giving people a false impression about their health and so a lot of people are like well my doctor said I was fine so I need to just continue eating McDonald's and doing whatever I'm doing when really damage, significant damage is already underway. It takes 20 years for diabetes to show up. 20 years of destruction and it's very slow and very gradual. It's green, 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 then one day it's yellow and then the doctor starts saying, well, I think you should start some lifestyle changes. Then it goes red. Ah, we need to put you on medication and you need to stop eating sugar or carbohydrates, right? And by then it's getting too late. Can you guys adjust it? I think it's getting too warm. Isn't it too warm? Are you guys good? Yes. Perhaps I should take off my jacket. No, I'm good. <laughs> so I have an obsession with, with these numbers because um, I think they're very deceptive. And, and when you look at the research, you find out that the ranges that are currently being acceptable as green are very misleading and that's why a lot of Americans are led into becoming diabetics because their doctors tell them you're okay when you're not so this green here is really a bad number for this age of this patient uh, am I making this point very clear yes. what should it, be? it should be about 5.1 or 4.9 or below I had a patient come in recently at 50 years old, she was at 4.9 and her daughter who was 28 years was at 5.2 and I said, you, there's a problem. 
you need to pay attention at 28 you're 5.2 directionally where is it going your mother at 50 is at 4.9 that's a very good measure right so it's very important that we look at these numbers contextually with people's age and where they are and begin to make sure that we manage their lifestyles in that context actually if you're not working on a farm or running 23 miles a day you should really not be eating carbohydrates That's what it is. If you are not, you should not be eating carbohydrates. Oh, yeah. I can't. Because I think the challenge is that, and, and most people are not taking nutrients, because most people who come visit my clinic say, I'm, I eat well, I'm fine. <laughs> uh, you're right, yeah. It's not that I want to challenge them whether they eat well or they don't eat well. Most of the fish we eat is toxic, right? That's a fact because you cannot verify in the restaurant whether it was wildly caught or farm grown. That's number one. <laughs> and therefore you're taking in a lot of heavy metals. Most of the chicken is not good, and most of the meat is not good. Yes, and obviously we need those things. We need proteins so or we'll all become vegetarian. And most of, the, most of the vegetable also has heavy metals. Especially broccoli, kale, has heavy metals because of the soil we are growing them in. So, I, I, I know I'm painting a very dark picture. You are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope I don't sound like Trump at the inauguration, but it is a very bad picture, <laughs> right? It's a very bad picture of where we are, and it begins to challenge the underlying question that if you want to live a healthy, long life, there is a serious issue at looking at your lifestyle and saying, how is that life going to play out? And I think that is the challenge that I bring to my patients. It is a serious time for you to take a stop, look at the information. I have a patient in Texas, the mother is 85. Very strong and healthy. She's 62. She's already showing signs of Parkinson's. So the big fundamental question is who's going to look after who? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the challenge we have facing in America. Who's going to look after who? Right? And she has traveled the world. She's worked really hard, worked for the World Bank. And we looked at her biomarkers. And she looked at her mother's biomarkers and said, how come she's healthier than me? She's 85, I'm 62, and she's healthier. It's the big generational question that most of us are asking if we're not... Yes, our environment is toxic. Okay? So let's move forward and look at some of the other numbers. I I'm not getting a lot of feedback from this audience. Why? Am I just too shocking? No, no, but you, uh, you have a life, so compare with your life. Everybody here knows what their A1C number is. Hello, can I see show of hands? How many people know their A1C number? I don't know, but I have it at home. <laughs> Shouldn't we all know what our A1C number is? So is your A1C number going up or going down? I don't take the next test yet. Who do we get it? Who do we? I take two tests. I was trying to look at heaven, whether we get it from up there. No, we get it from the, running this test. Oh, you got it? Yeah, they, they got it. You're fine. Yeah, they looked at your number and you were fine. And I'm sure Simone has tailored your diet to, to take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> right, Simon. Oh, yeah. Simon has tailored everything to make sure that those numbers are under control. So, who else has challenges with? Uh, so, who is really managing their A1C number very well? Talk to us. Who's doing a good job? Uh, 
So no no sugar in the last three weeks. No, 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 but the objective is not to lower it in, in three weeks. She's going to be on that for the rest of her life. Ah, really? So, yes, that's about 200 grams in those scoops. Oh, that's, uh, you're taking the glucose medical food. Okay. How is that making you feel now that you don't have... Oh, which one are you taking? Ah, okay. Yeah, that's when it's slightly sweet, yes. Oh, that's the little tablet, the methylated B12? Ah, so how, how does it feel three weeks in, no sugar, no carbohydrate also? What spikes, what spikes? What do you mean? You have a craving. I don't know I what that is. I have a meal, but I still have craved sugar after the meal. I do too. It's that's how I am. I need meal. sugar to finish. I mean, oh, I need yeah. sweet to finish my meal, and that's mentally yeah. that's what it is. But I don't have any sugar. So, uh, but did, how, how long did it take you to win off it? You know, it's all a mind thing. Yes. Yeah. When you, when you know that it's more important to become healthy than I'm good in ignoring it, so I know sure, sure, it was the first week was, was really hard, but it is. When, when it was really bad, then I had a little bit of something, just teeny tiny, but then I felt that my heartburn is coming up again, and I just said, no, it's not worth it. Mm. I felt so, mm. important yeah. so you're feeling good now, three weeks in? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's good. Is, How's your blood pressure? Good, very good. Oh, okay. Never had a problem with blood pressure. She's not eating protein, however. Yeah, I need to So how are you dealing, you're doing plant protein? You're not eating even, no, no, I mean plant protein. No, plant protein is fine, but you need to supplement with, uh, with some other things to uh, get the additional uh, amino acids that are required. Um, I think we were having some problems too with somebody today with omega-3s. So we have some plant oils that are really uh, optimized um, uh, plant so omega-3s because she's vegetarian. Okay, all right. <coughs> yeah, the challenge with almonds is that a lot of them are molded. Because the, when the almonds are harvested in transit, they get wet, and so when they dry them, they're already molding. So it is really challenging to find almonds that have not molded. That's the other reason I don't eat uh, guacamole, because they do put in a lot of molded avocado in the guacamole, and molding it's a big issue in your GI architecture. So mold, so a lot of dried fruits are really very challenging because of mold. So we also love to go to Fab Fabory and fish place. That's uh, a yeah. very good, nice restaurant. And I wonder, and I, and I question one day, is there white fish or brown fish? Yeah, that, so yeah, Vincent yeah. did the research for us on that. So let's look at some genetics. How many people here are MTHFR? How many people have done their genetic testing? So how many people are MTHFR? People who have issues with folate metabolism. So those are the people we have prescribed methyl B12 to people who have that uh, mutation. It's a mutation that impairs your folate metabolism. And so we tend to prescribe a methyl or methylated B12 for those people to supplement. It's a significantly very important uh, nutrient, vitamin B12, 
And if you have that mutation and you're taking the normal cobalamin B12, then you still have a big folate homocysteine problem. And it is very important that you look at the testing for that. It's very, very important. Okay. So let's look at the next page. We look at your fatty acids. The trans fatty acid, the saturated fatty acids. You look at this person, their saturated fatty index is high. There are higher levels of plasma saturated fatty acids are associated with an increased risk. And then down, you go down, you look at the monosaturated fatty acid index and the omega 3s, the EPAs, the DHA, and the LA. These are all components of fatty acids that are critical for good health. And so it's important that as you look at your health and you look at food sources and nutrients, that you have appropriate balance across them. What we have done with our algorithms in designing nutrient support for all our patients is that we've taken all these numbers We've taken the FDA requirements for your daily nutrient allowance, the DRA, and then we've taken the nutrients from our quality supplies and we have built profiles for making recommendations so that you're getting slightly above the daily limit in the areas where you have shortages. And how do we know that shortage? We look at your biomarkers. And that's how we build your recommendation. It's one of the things we've done here with our AI architecture that really takes all this data and then runs the algorithm and generates a profile for you. I know Simone was saying somebody else does that where they customize your supplements, but we take supplements from our vendors and create this customized profile. So once all your results come in, we can generate this by running these numbers against our database of supplements to generate what we call the recommended list. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. So that when we then give you your recommendation, we can tell you how much of each of these things is in your daily nutrient load. Because at some point, with all the toxicity and distrust in labeling, we might be just eating only nutrients. Like they say in the movie Wally, -E, we will just get a feeding bottle three times a day. Yeah. That gives us exactly what we need in the right proportions. Because now if you go to the shops or to the markets, what you're getting, nobody has any trust in it, right? Whether the quality of fats, the sugars, uh, the quality, the toxins, right? There's a, uh, there's a mounting distrust in our manufacturing process and in our distribution process. Whether it's bottled water, whether it's filtration systems, Right, everybody's questioning everything. And so we feel that if you really don't want to eat, you could survive on our nutrient load. And that would be enough for you. Right? And we are recommending that for a lot of our patients. Let's go to the next page and look. Any comments on that? You, you had a comment. I do. Yes. Yeah, but some people, yeah, if you really are challenged. That means we get more room in our house because we <laughs> <laughs> I like, I, I didn't even think of that. You could rent out your kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> because what do you need a kitchen for if you could just have a blender and a collection of bottles and you put the scoops in there and blend it? The worst thing is also going to restaurants, right? Oh my God, forget it. There's <laughs> oh, really? You don't go anymore? No. Wow. No. I don't want to be looked at. I'm a weirdo. 
because you can't <laughs> eat anything there. Yeah. Dr. Lim, do you eat in restaurants? Yes. You do? You have specific restaurants you go to? Oh, <laughs> right, yeah, like you go and then you take your metalloclair and other things to get rid of the toxicity. <laughs> That's an interesting way to look at it. You see that? We have some of that stuff. So you can really go to the restaurant and eat, but when you get home, you take your probiotics, your prebiotics, and your metalloclair, and you your detoxifiers, and you just clean what is bad, excrete it, and absorb what is good. <laughs> That could be a good strategy, right? So let's look at your chemistry tests. So a lot of these tests are really looking at uh, how well your kidney is functioning, your bone, your creatinine, your albumin. So all of those uh, should be in the right zones. Then it looks at glucose, AST, alkaline. All of these are very important uh, chemistry tests for you. Then it looks at your thyroid tests, right? The total T4, the free T4, T4 total T3, and the free T3, uh, which are all very uh, important chemistry tests overall. Then it goes to look at your kidney tests. It's, I always find this report very interesting that they separate African Americans out of others. But you know that's a fundamental weakness that we have. So because our values are actually different from other people with regard to the kidney function. Uh, I'm not African American, so we don't have a number for Africans. We just have for African Americans. Uh, so I don't know if that's applicable. That's a challenge with global data, right? Then it looks at your muscle, your creatinine kinase. Uh, just how well your mu your muscle functions are. Then it looks at a very, very important thing that Dr. Lim and I were talking about. Most Americans are short on vitamin D. And Dr. Lim was just talking how she doses on vitamin D. And sometimes she doses at some really significant high levels. We go up to 10,000, but you were talking about dosing at about 50,000 units, right? You know, so that's a significant, I, I have not heard of that, but um, we go up to about 10,000 a week. Uh, but you were talking about like 50,000 a week, right? Or okay. is it a day or a week? week. A week, yes. A no, no, yeah, but that's for one week. Oh. That's a weekly dose. That's not a daily dose. Okay. Yes, she was doing 50,000. Okay, well, everybody does. I don't know anybody who does not. Okay. Most people have deep vitamin D deficiency, especially since we don't, are not out in the sun farming. Right. Okay. So how's this going? And then we just have a summary of the results. Uh, we have the... Sorry? Yeah, go ahead. Right. Well, but I think that um, it, it is a good idea. So typically, our standard recommendation, except for people who show significant red on vitamin D, we put them on ten thousand or on the five thousand daily, right? Or is it two thousand? I can't remember. Is it the five thousand? That's weekly. No, daily. Oh really? No, ten thousand is daily. Is that what we give you? Yeah. Okay, I, I was. Oh. I don't use them though because it's in my other cell phone. But no, yeah. I have ten thousand the DK. Oh, in the beginning we put you on the ten thousand yeah. daily. Okay, and then now you are on just on the ones that are in the other supplements. Yeah, my, I don't put vitamin D because it's on my other supplements. Yes, it's built in. Okay, but vitamin D as a supplement is very important. So. Uh, how many do you take, Dr. Lim, a day or a week? A week, I'm lazy, so I just pop them all in a day. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> what do you mean? You pop 50,000 a day? Oh, really? Oh, really? Just to make sure. 50,000 is a prescription strength. Yeah, it's a prescription strength, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I take about, I forget sometimes, but I take about 10,000 extra about once or twice a week. 
but typically I, I wouldn't take it every day. Okay. Any other comments on this? So I, I didn't go into all of it. The last page just shows you the summary. But before that last page, it looks at hormones and specifically looks at the female hormones. Uh, we do an extra hormone test uh, that is much more comprehensive. We call it the Dutch test, the Dutch plus test that looks at progesterone, estrogen, and uh, testosterone and looks at the balances around it. Um, one of the challenges we find is the overall theory that I'm calling it a theory because it's still open for debate. It's about hormone replacement therapy for menopausal women. Um, in spite of the new research, there's still a lot of debate whether women should be, and I know some of my patients are struggling with that debate, right Kim? You, you're not comfortable with it. So we have put Kim on our, on supplements, on nutrients that support the, uh, the, the hormones levels, right? Because she didn't want the prescription, the hormone replacement therapy, the bioidenticals, right? Uh, Elizabeth, you are also on it, right? Oh, you stopped. Uh, well, I was on one thing for about two or three months, and then I got another thing, and I'm not sure what I'm on now. So, I, I, yeah, we gave you, we gave you the, we gave you, yeah, we gave you the nutrients. So we are putting most of our patients on the nutrients because there's a lot of conversations around. Dr. Lim, what is your view on that? Hormone replacement therapy. You don't do it? Okay, so that's what we have. We started with hormone replacement therapy. We have coalesced around using nutrients to support it, mostly from metagenics, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. the metagenics. Two different, I did three different yeah, of yeah, with a combination. combination. Yeah, so that's what we're doing now. Um, anybody else is taking any hormones? menopausal you are not you did it they didn't recommend it for you i don't need them oh you don't okay all right how, how do you know you don't need them simon because <laughs> i feel healthy <laughs> <laughs> i trust the wisdom of my body okay but did you run your labs and then i've had my labs too. oh okay <laughs> that's the important thing yeah it's not everybody who has to have it yeah it's really just a balancing issue um, to just reduce your cardiovascular risk, Correct. right? There's a lot of concern about um, breast cancer uh, with the hormone replacement therapy. And so that's the concern, underlying concern we also have. But you need to do the hormonal balance to reduce the cardiovascular risk, right? That's the key issue. Any other comments? Are we good? Yeah. So we brought the Beamer. Uh, who has never tried the Beamer? Anybody want to try the Beamer? Kim, you want to try? Yeah, I'll try. I'll try. All right. Can you help Kim on the Beamer? We need a blanket. Yeah. But give us a testament on the Beamer. <laughs> Beate, stand up and tell us about the Beamer. Why you bought it and oh. why you think it's a legitimate purchase? The way how I got into it, uh, yeah. I took care of a lady that was in her 80s and she was losing her eyesight and she believed in that the um, bioelectromagnetic energy regulator, the beamer, can EMF, help yeah. her to get her eyesight back. That, that, who, who came with that belief? She did or you did? I got introduced by it. I was all like um, okay. enthusiastic about it and I told her, she's like, oh my god, my, answer, my prayers just got answered. You need to show me, we need to go there, we need to get one and so, long story short, I bought one and she wanted to pay me monthly until she owns it. Yeah. And uh, she used it. Um, but she was like, my eyesight is still not getting better. 
but like she already said, you cannot look at this one specific thing that you say that's what I needed for. Your body knows better. And she had cancer. And, um, and she knew this before she did the bima, or it was afterwards? Her body was just breaking down and um, she did not do anything for her cancer and she eventually passed away from the cancer. But I could tell uh, she was a lot more balanced with the bima match. And one day she decided, I'm not going to use it anymore. It doesn't do anything for me. And she got really aggressive. So, so why have changed her attitude. why have you continued to use it? Is it because you bought it or? No, no uh, I could tell. Um, I I just I'm very curious. I want to know does it really work for me? So I had major headaches, and the headaches helped. They calmed down with it, and um, I guess um, from the way I I work I overworked I work way too much. I had uh, pain on my fingers and on my toes, and that went away. With the beamer? With the beamer. After how many months of use? Uh, I would say about two months. That's why going on it and feeling it and saying, oh yeah, I feel better. It doesn't work like that. you got to use it for a long or time. You know, I can't say it after one week. I know beamer offers you can try it for a week you still don't go after one week and it does so much to your body that you really don't know but it does really all good for you it does so interesting the circulation is really i think it's improving it gets so much better and, and you just got to look at it as a, as a big tree. Yes, yeah, so, so, if you, so, so like Kim, if you're lying on it and you're skeptical, it might not work because you're it's negating the yeah, like electromagnetic the fields. The only thing <laughs> a lot of people can tell when they are on the people uh, Are you feeling sleepy? No. Oh. Close your eyes. Just close your eyes. When my dog was here, she gave me a testimonial. When I get up on the beamer, or Simone gets on the beamer, the dog wants to get up on top of it. Really? Yeah. She just loves it. Yeah, mine lay always on top of it. Oh, when you're on the beamer, they love it? The dogs? Yeah. I don't have dogs. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. So. so, and so, you'll fall asleep for how long? For about an hour? Per, you get on it too? Every day. Oh, wow. There's no temperature change at all. No, but I've caught most of the most. Really? Yeah. 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 No, but I'm glad though. Yeah. Because if it's hot, I won't want it. No. What do you think about it, Dr. Cho? Yeah, have you heard of the Bima? Well, Simon, can you explain to people what the Bima is? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's a revolutionary piece of equipment. It's been around for over 20 years. And the technology that's here is patented and it's been embraced by NASA. NASA have put this technology into spacesuits and into seats and into beds that they're putting on the space station. Because a big thing for people who go into outer space is they lose blood circulation. So as I was saying, you're not going to feel anything straight away because when you sit here, do you feel the blood rush rushing through your heart? No. Do you feel the blood going to your brain? No. Do you feel the blood going to your feet? <coughs> no. So it's no on all levels. The only way you can actually see if this is working for you is to do the blood tests. And my testimony is this. About a month ago, I came in and I saw Vincent. And he did this whole big scan of me. And I must tell you, I left here very disappointed because I had lost 35 pounds and I was very excited. I felt that I was, you know, full of vitality. But he told me that I had the biological age of someone who was 65. And I'm 61, right? And so I thought, you know what? I went home, forgot all about it. And then I came back 
a week ago, and my biological age had dropped four years. Well, you were like spending all night on the beamer? No. I, and then I thought about it, and I thought, because I said to Vincent, maybe I'm exercising, and I thought, no, I've just got one of these spin gyms, you know, from Forbes Riley. I'm not doing anything, really. Mm. Um, I am patching, yes. And then I thought, you know what? I'm on this bed twice a day. I do it for 20 minutes. The recommended time for a staff to start with is eight minutes. So that's what I believe. Because if your blood is moving through your body and you have better circulation, all the nutrients you're taking are going to move around the body to the targeted areas. You know, we have this discussion about stem cells. We have stem cells, and how do we know where they're going to go? We don't, because only God in our body knows where they need it. But can you imagine if you've got better circulation and you're using stem cells and you're taking nutrients and you're on a nutrient dense diet everything is going to where it needs to go so that you live a vital lifestyle so this is one of those pieces that you have at home now you're going to say to me well how come you have only just got yours two months ago well I was interested in the science but something rather interesting happened to our family. When we were going to do the, have the product delivered to our home, uh, two, so it, there was a delay, and this was in 2017. And two days later, our mother, Rick's mom, Pear's wife, of 90 years old, went to the gym in the morning, paid her taxes at night, and that night had a massive hemorrhagic stroke. So I thank God that we actually didn't try the Beamer, because can you imagine the guilt I would have had if she had tried the Beamer and had had the hemorrhagic stroke. So I shelved it. And then last year, Pear was diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. He failed a cognitive test. He couldn't go in and have a brain scan. So I worked with a doctor out of San Francisco the, the Bredesen protocol, and I've changed his diet. And over from December, when he came home in a wheelchair to what you see today, I attribute that to nutrient-dense diet, very compliant. He's not compliant. I am the compliant one, right? Water, he has nutrition that is made for him based on what you're going to do here based on your tests and your epigenetics. And improving the circulation. You know, I got the because I thought it would be great for his back. But when we got the tests, and I was at the event this weekend, I thought to myself, you know what? He has amazing cognition now, based on everything is moving around his body at a more efficient rate. Mm. For most of us, our blood is not moving around efficiently. So It's sluggishly it, flowing. Exactly. So if I was... If you like muddy water. If you're expecting to get on that and feel something, I'm, so, I, I'm sorry to say you won't. Because again, as I said, you don't feel the, the blood going to your brain, you don't mm. feel it going through your heart or going to your hands and feet. But trust the science, and this is what excites me about this clinic. This clinic is very focused on letting you, the patient, have control over your health because they give you the information. So you are responsible for your health. <coughs> And this is another piece that allows you to be responsible for your health. Thank you. Evidence-based. <laughs> <laughs> At least their whole family speaks to it and Beate. So we have a, quite a couple of users here. Elizabeth, what's your experience with uh, the Beamer? Uh, because this part is the one that actually makes it work. Because no, no, no. You didn't see any difference? Oh, really? Were you using it properly? Like how? We get on this thing and we see that it can go up to 10. 
So we jump onto it at 10, not realizing what it does is it detoxifies. And that's another essential piece of this combined with this clinic. They put you through detoxification. So, so, so what you're saying is that like your lymphatic system, drainage system, it supports the circulation yes. for that, for, for releasing and, and excreting the detox. Yeah. Which jacks up your water requirements. So if you're on the beamer and you're not drinking, that's not yes. good. Kim, you, you need, need to drink to before. Do. And yes. <laughs> All right. So, so it, it's very interesting because um, yeah. um, we have a couple of new technologies that we're introducing. So I wanted to look at the beamer today. Um, we've uh, introduced the, the the stem cell patches, right? The patches, the uh, the light uh, light therapy patches, uh, and our nutrient. And uh, Dr. Lima and I were talking about hydration, yeah. right? Uh, and we're very big on hydration here. So in everything that we do, we are putting hydration. So it looks like hydration, hydration, hydration. Is really at the forefront of a lot of this. So very interesting. So um, ha Kim, so I'm not going to ask you because you cannot feel your improved circulation. No, I, mean, I, I don't know that because, like, like, like was saying, because with stem cells, at least I can measure them. Because ever since I'm using stem cell, actually my score is going up on the the machine. Yeah, that so fast? Yeah, no, it's changed. Yeah. So I hope you have not been using, have you been using stacking on the stem cells, like using a pack of four at the same time? No, no, just checking whether you're accelerating. I'm, you, I'm, I'm going to run out of space to put the fifth one there. <laughs> the fifth one. <laughs> but you know, what I know that the protocol is, would be fantastic if we could use the protocol is, would be fantastic if you get measured, where patients come in, they do all these tests, and one of the, then after that, for the next week, you come in once a day for eight minutes, mm -hmm. and then you do the testing. Mm. Yeah, because then the tests will say, "Hey, Kim, look what's happening." Yes. Oh, remember, I, that's why I was 